The City of Cemeteries by Susan Muchmore. Characters. Sylvia de Glapion, a 55-year-old widowed homemaker, married 33 years. She and her husband, Charlie, raised two daughters in their small Creole cottage. Sylvia looks at her recent wood widowhood as a chance to start over. The last weeks with her husband's were, husband were rough. She has not shed many tears. Played by Susan Muchmore. Wanda, youngest of two daughters, has a no-nonsense approach to my future, and I am wicked smart. Wants to become a lawyer someday. Played by Lisa. Danny, their firstborn daughter, married to a tall, dark, and handsome fellow named Louie, beautiful with dark wavy hair and brown eyes like her father, has a 10-year-old son with Louie to whom they are devoted, played by Ruth Ann. Louie, Jenny's husband, a great father, makes a good living as a streetcar driver, one of the friendliest drivers in the city, was just promoted to supervisor on the number 12 line, which passes the most beautiful southern mansions on St. Charles Avenue, played by Barry. Joey, Sylvia's 10-year-old grandson, idolized his late Papa Charlie, played by Eric. Al, a widower who still has an eye for the ladies, shopkeeper at the ANP, kind and honest, a friend to many, knows the names of all his customers, his meat is fresh and his shop is cool once since he installed a window air cooler. Played by Thomas. George, a friend of Charlie's who worked with him at the docks on the French Quarter side of the Mississippi River. Played by Craig. Nadine, a respectable middle-aged woman who, because of recent affairs, works in a dive bar. Played by Laura. Officer, a police officer who is assigned to the French Quarter Precinct. He's professional and knows the city part of the quarter well. Played by Craig. Ruth, a middle-aged neighbor across the street, spends afternoons hosting coffee clutches on the porch and gossiping with the ladies on her street. Played by Ruth Ann. Agnes, middle-aged, lives next door to Sylvia, loves gossiping at the coffee clutch on, a, on Sylvia's front porch. Narrator. Played by Catherine. August 1943, New Orleans. People walk slowly in a city that care forgot while waiting for an afternoon shower, a brief respite to the heat and humidity of the summer day. It has only been a month since Sylvia de Glapion found her husband dead in their bed one morning. She tried to wake him to no avail after he passed out in a drunken stupor the night before. It is a typical August morning as Sylvia walks up Frenchman Street on her way to the A&P to buy pickle meat, an important ingredient in every housewife's red beans and rice. She dabs her forehead with her hanky. Hello, Al. I don't think I'll ever get used to this August heat. It gives me the vapors. Bless your heart for the air condition. Good to see you, Miss Sylvia. How are you? I was sorry to hear about your husband passing. Uh, pretty good. It was a shock though, and we still don't know what happened. Well, I hope you find out soon. Are you having the family over? I just sliced up some fresh pickle meat since it's Monday. No, just washing clothes and cooking red beans on Mondays like my mama before me. Give me half a pound of pickle meat and a half pound of boudin. My girls love sausage. You should try my beans sometimes. Charlie always said they taste like going, dying and going to heaven. Say, uh, 
would you like to go to a movie with me sometime? Sure, Al. Call me. Sylvia gives a wink to Al and then turns to leave. <coughs> Sylvia slowly walks home with her hanky in one hand and her groceries in the other. At home, she hangs out the wash and carries a heavy pot of water to the stove. She pours red beans into the pot, followed by meat and secret spices. The beans cook low and slow all day. Hello. Hi, Mama. Are you sure you're up to having my brood over for dinner? It's only a month since Daddy passed. Well, of course. I still have my family to take care of, and there's a pot of beans on the stove. We eat at six. Okay. See you then, Mama. Love you. Sylvia stirs the pot of beans, smashing some against the cast iron pot with a big spoon. <gasps> that makes them creamy. Woo-wee. Time to make the rice. She opens the transom window above the door of her Creole cottage. She can hear the afternoon rain, and the breeze brings much-needed relief from the heat. Mima, look what I got. I named him Charlie. Oh, my, Joey, where'd you get that pretty little thing? Daddy brought him home after work yesterday. He said good boys can, should have a puppy to love. Some lady at one of the street, streetcar stops had a litter in a basket, so I scooped him up. He was pretty squirmy in my lap. Good thing we were only two stops from the car barn. Now, Joey, go take the puppy out in the backyard to play. Yes, ma'am. Mama, how are you holding up? Any news about how Daddy passed? Nothing yet. Lisa said they'd let me know soon. I don't, I just don't get it. He was fine one day and did the next. Hello, 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 I'm here. Oh, those beans sure do smell good. We're in the kitchen. Joey's in the backyard with a new puppy. Oh, a new puppy? <gasps> Let me see. The next morning, Joey stops by his grandma's on the way to school. He sits at the kitchen table and waits for her to bre bre fix breakfast. She puts coffee beans in the grinder with pieces of hickory root, a coffee lot plant that makes the ration beans last longer. What would you like for breakfast, Joey? Fritz, me mine one egg. Okay, but don't be late for school. Yes, ma'am, I won't. Joey leaves and Sylvia starts washing dishes. There's a knock at the door. Hello, officer. Can I help you? Well, may I come in, please? Oh, sure. Where are my manners? Of course, have a seat on over there. It was Charlie's chair. I'm sorry for your loss, ma'am, but I'm afraid I have some disturbing news. Your husband's autopsy shows that he was poisoned. Poisoned? What? How? We have a few questions we'd like you to answer. I need you to come with me to the precinct. Uh, okay. Let me get my pocketbook. Sylvia climbs into the police car and hopes her neighbors aren't watching. It's too late. Ruth and Agnes are sitting on the front porch across the street as the car drives off to the police station house. Oh my, I wonder what could have happened this time. I never knew how Sylvia could put up with Charlie being driven home by the cops all those times after drinking and carousing. He sure did drink a lot. I talked to Sylvia yesterday and she seemed almost giddy about being a widow. She talked about starting over. Can you imagine? And at her age? You know, something strange happened over there a couple days before Charlie died. Sylvia was cooking her beans, and I just finished my wash, so I popped on over for a visit. We were in the kitchen, so I picked up a spoon 
to give those beans a taste. But before I could put the stone in my the spoon in my mouth, she smacked it right out of my hand and it fell on the floor. I was she apologized and said a mosquito was on my hand. Then she picked up the spoon and handed me a glass of iced tea. I never did get to taste those beans. I just hope nothing's wrong. Poor thing doesn't need any more bad news. What with Charlie dying and all. Sylvia returns home a couple of hours later in a taxi cab. She sees Agnes peeking out from behind a window and waves at her before going into the house. Wanda, you startled me half to death. What are you doing home? I thought you had a date with that handsome man from City Hall. I'm sorry, Mom. I did not mean to startle you. What? Is that a new hat? Oh, what's in those bags? A new dress and some shoes. What? <laughs> oh, man. Papa hasn't been gone for about a month and you're just out shopping? What else did you get? Well, oh, how did you go? Well, a nice policeman gave me a ride to the precinct station. They had questions about how your daddy died. They suspect he was poisoned. No. Tell him how he died. He drank himself to death slowly and painfully. And you're and and that you're a saint for putting up with him for so long. <gasps> Hush. Someone might hear you. I don't know. I didn't even know you knew about that. Mama, um, uh, how could I not? I live in this house too. Did you forget? You didn't poison him. I have to go, but I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Ron the heads to the police station. A bell on the front counter says, ring for service. Hello, officer. I'm Wanda de Clapillon. My mother was here earlier concerning my father's death. Now, what is going on? The coroner's report shows your father was poisoned. We talked to your neighbors. It seems your father was quite fond of the drink. Turns out he fell off a bar stool at Snake and Jake's on the night he was poisoned. Well, what does any of that have to do with my mother? Some women just snap after years of living with a drunk. Do you know of anyone who'd want your father poison? Of course not, and neither does my mother. Good day, officer. Wanda has an awful feeling that she and her mother are suspects. With no time to waste, she returns home to ask her mother some questions before hitting the pavement again. Mama, you must help me to find out who poisoned Daddy. We're going to have to find out who did before one of us gets arrested. Come on, we're going to the cemetery. We might find some answers there. Charles de Glapion was buried in the family tomb, which held many of his ancestors, including Marie Laveau, the beloved voodoo queen of the late 19th century. Her compassion for those in need is legend. It is believed that if you draw three X's on her tomb, she will help you. The tomb is covered with them. The ones that have a circle around them worked. Here it is, St. Louis Cemetery. Your daddy's in good company in this tomb. Did you bring the chalk? Okay, here goes. X, X, and X. Marie Laveau, help us find out who poisoned my daddy. Good job. We should double up on the superstition with an act of faith. Let's go over to the cathedral and light a candle. Wanda and Sylvia light candles in hopes of having their prayers answered. On their way out of the church, Sylvia recognizes a man who worked with Charlie. George, wait! 
But hi, Celia. Hi, Amanda. How are you? Well, it's not so good, George. Um, we found out that Charlie was poisoned, and we feel that the police may suspect us. So we must track down Charlie's last moments and movements to try to catch his killer. Wow. Okay. Uh, let me think. Uh, um, I remember us going to Snack and Jake's for beer after work. And after a couple of drinks, Charlie was chatting up some bombing. So I, I went home, and that's the last I saw him. Well, can you take us there? We need to find that barmaid. Uh, sure. It, it's just around the corner. Snake and Jake's is one of those smoke-filled dive bars in the quarter that reeks of cigarettes. The sticky floors are covered with spilled beer. It is said that women who go there won't sit on the bar stools for fear of catching something. Hey, George, who are your friends? This is Charlie's wife and his daughters, Sylvia and Wanda. They're trying to piece together Charlie's whereabouts the night before he died. The police say he was poisoned. Poisoned? That's crazy. Let's see. I closed up around 10. Charlie was still here, so I called him a cab and headed home. Did anything else happen that night that might help us? Come to think, he didn't live alone. There was a gaggler sitting at the end of the bar. When Charlie left, she followed him. Her name is Stella. She is a dowdy woman, middle aged, with flaming red hair. Well, thanks, Nadine. Here's my number. Call me if you remember anything else. Just as they are about to leave, a woman fitting the description walks through the door. Don't look now, but at the end of the bar is Stella. This place gives me the creeps. I need to get Mama home, George. George, will you take it from here? George hits a dead end with Stella, calls it a night, and they go their separate ways. Miss Sylvia, I didn't expect to see you so soon. How are your red beans? Bye now, but I need your help. Do, do you know anything about poison? Poison? You got rats? No, I'm desperate. I know I can trust you. See, my Charlie died because someone poisoned him and the police think it's me or Wanda. <laughs> That's impossible. You wouldn't hurt a fly. How can I help? Just then, a woman enters and walks around the store looking for something. That woman who just came in. Do you know her? Not really. She came in about a month ago. Bought some rat poison and arsenic, I think. Said she had rats under her house. <gasps> We've seen her before. It was at Snake and Jake's yesterday. I remember that flaming red hair. What were you doing in that dive bar? George took me. George? A friend of Charlie's. I can't explain. I, I have to get to the police station. I'll drive you. Al locks up the shop and hangs a closed sign on the door. As they pull up in front of the police station, they see the red-headed woman headed inside with an officer who has her by the arm. That's her. That's the woman from the bar. She's the one that brought the arsenic from you. Come on, let's get out of here. We have some puzzle pieces to assemble. That evening, Sylvia, Al, Wanda, and George return to Snake and Jake's. Nadine and a couple of regulars tell them that the red-headed woman was always snuggling up to Al. He kept telling her that he wasn't married. He'd take her out. He'd drink two beers and then head home every time.
They never saw him drunk until that fateful night. Suddenly, a police officer enters the bar. Miss Sylvia, Wanda, why are you all people hanging around a place like this? Well, we came to do some sleuthing. We're trying to find my father's murderer. Same here. You see, we tracked a suspect's whereabouts in a couple of poisonings around here and led us here. Don't tell me. She has a flaming red hair. That's right. How did you know? The red-headed woman was arrested that night. It seems she was a regular and became friendly with several men at the bar like Charlie. Whenever she was rebuffed, she'd put a few drops of arsenic in their beers just to teach them a lesson. Most of the men just got violently ill. But poor old Charlie had a little too much in his beer, and it killed him. Mama, Mama, are you okay? I am so sorry I blamed our daddy for being a drunk. Can you ever forgive me? Oh, yes, baby. We never suspe suspected he was slowly being poisoned to death. Wanda, he was a good man. I know, Mama. I know. I think we need to go back to that cemetery. We have some X's to circle, and he may he rest in peace. And now, The Stove by Laura Liu. The characters are the announcer, played by Ruth Ann. Mrs. Mary Snickers, an overworked housewife, played by Laura. Mr. Snickers, Mary's husband, Played by Craig. God the Almighty, with a sense of humor. Played by Thomas. Nancy, a hairdresser, friendly and talkative. Played by Lisa. Police officer, played by Eric. It is the morning before Thanksgiving, and Mrs. Mary Snickers has been busy preparing for the big feast tomorrow. Her family is hosting the celebration this year for about 20 family and friends, and Mary wants everything to be perfect. She's gotten just about everything taken care of food-wise. Now she just wants to look presentable for the big holiday tomorrow. So she heads to her hair appointment at the Forever Beautiful Hair Salon. Forever Beautiful Hair Salon. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Snickers. You made it just in time for your appointment. Oh, uh, just a wash in a set today? Nancy, you have no idea what I had to do just to get out of the house today. I've been prepping and cooking nonstop the last few days. Oh, follow me over to the hair washing station. So, what are you making for the Thanksgiving holiday this year? Oh, all the traditional dishes, pies, green bean casserole, mashed potatoes, turkey stuffing, you name it. <laughs> Same here. I still have a lot to do. So I am closing up the shop early today. Soon as I finish with your hair, I am hurrying home to finish up my cooking. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful to have an extra stove and oven? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. A stove? Wait. Oh my gosh, the stove. I forgot to turn off the stove. I have to run home, Nancy. My house is burning down. Without waiting for Nancy to finish, Mrs. Snickers bolts out the door, grabs her purse, and dashes through the salon door. Wait, wait, Mrs. Snickers, there's still shampoo in your hair. But Mrs. Snickers doesn't stop. She opens the car door, gets in, and turns on the engine before the door slams shut. She steps on the gas pedal as the light turns red. As Mrs. Snickers races home, she is thinking about how to break the news to her husband. 
could I be so careless? How could I forget to turn off the stove? On the way, Mrs. Snickers practices what she will say to her husband. Honey, remember you said you want to remodel the kitchen? Now is the perfect time. He won't buy it. Should I call him now or should I wait until he gets home tonight? Oh, I hate this. He's going to kill me. Mrs. Snickers imagines her husband's reactions. No home and no place to live. Thanksgiving is ruined and all because of you. Oh no, please help me. Help me please God, please, please. <laughs> Yes, Mary, I was just about to take a nap, but your pleadings were deafening. Thank God for responding to my call for help. I forgot to turn off the stove. Could you please turn it off for me? I only asked for this one time. I'll do whatever you want. Now, Mary, you said the same thing when you asked for help with your earrings. But it's different this time, God, I promise. Sure it is. This time it will make you focus more on what you do in the future. Oh, no. After all, God, uh, I help those who help themselves. Just as Mary is fully grasping what has happened, she sees the police car in the rear view mirror with lights flashing and siren blaring. <coughs> Shaken, Mary pulls over and waits for the officer. May I see your driver's license and registration, ma'am? I'm so sorry, officer. I ran a red light because I need to get home right away. My house is on fire. I forgot to turn off the stove. Oh, I was just going to tell you that one of your rear tail lights is out. Oh, uh, thank you, officer, for letting me know. Uh, I, I promise to get it fixed right away. Uh, no, I mean, like, later today. I can see you're a bit overwrought, ma'am, so I'll let you go this time, but don't let it happen again. Well, the officer lets her go, but as she turns onto her street, Mary smells the smoke. Oh no, smoke. I'm doomed. I, I burned my house down to the ground. Wait a minute. No fire truck in front of the house. No smoke coming, up, coming out of the chimney. And the house still stands. Maybe it's just barbecue smoke coming from somebody's house. Hold on. Maybe the fire is burning on the inside. Mary pulls over, jumps out of the car, and rushes inside the house. Everything is quiet. The turkey is still cooking, but there's no house fire. <sighs> oh, thank you, God. Thank you for answering my prayers. You're welcome, Mary. And a happy Thanksgiving. And now, if you excuse me, I need to get back to Nancy's before she closes up the shop. Oh, God, please help me make it in time. <laughs>